came to uh, New York when I was 17 to study Middle Eastern history and politics at Columbia University. And after that, I ended up getting involved in the making of a documentary film called Control Room about Al Jazeera's coverage of the Iraq War. Um, Ronit Avani, who is currently my partner at Just Vision, watched Control Room in the theaters and got in touch with me to help her make the first documentary of Just Vision in Counterpoint. And when we were touring with Counterpoint, we often got a question um, about, well, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? Why aren't Palestinians using nonviolence? And if only Palestinians used nonviolence, then there would be peace. And we knew that the um, there was this very, you know, this was a very simplistic way of looking at things because there are many communities and activities in the region locally that are have been using nonviolence. Palestinians have used nonviolence since the 20s to try to get the British out. Uh, but um, it's you know nonviolent resistance is much more complicated than simply oh just use nonviolence and it will work. So we wanted to talk about um, one example on the ground where um, people have used this method strategically and it has created dividends to the community, but it also, uh, that also had the capacity to show what are the challenges and that, um, so that the conversation moves a little bit away from the theoretical of, oh, if only Palestinians use nonviolence, to what does it actually look like when a community decides to use nonviolent strategies. I have also heard repeatedly here in the United States um, that um, that same question, why don't Palestinians use the Gandhi method, why is it do you think that the American media doesn't seem to sufficiently report on these efforts because as you said the Palestinians have been using nonviolent protests for decades and yet uh, the people here don't seem to be aware of it. Mm -hmm. I think there's a problem with um, narratives. I think journalists in, uh, in general cover um, topics that fit within the general narrative of coverage of a particular conflict. And the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has, for 60 years now, very much been based on the um, overwhelmingly uh, amount of attention being paid to politicians or to militants in the military. And that's what um, that's what journalists cover on, and it's, and it's a process to fit stories into what the general public um, understands as being the conflict, what the conflict looks like. To bring a story that doesn't fit into that narrative is um, complicating people's understanding of a region. And for journalists, that's a bigger challenge that I think really requires, it's almost like a whole re-understanding of what the conflict is. And partly what we want to do with this film is bringing in the stories to complicate a little bit the simplistic view that many people have of the conflict of a, you know, one side against the other um, in a battle where if one wins, the other loses, and showing that this is not a zero-sum game, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is much more complex than that, that Israelis and Palestinians work together and So they have, they can, they, can, they can have common interests. And they have, can have common interests, and they can struggle together. And, uh, and I think for journalists, this is not, this often is harder to encapsulate in a single image, um, and they find it that to sell those stories to their editors is harder because um, it's a business and the newspapers have been selling very well, covering this really Palestinian conflict, focused completely on bloodshed or breakdowns on political negotiations. Right. And hopefully now, with I've been seeing already, even in this uh, past six months of the film being out, that the film has offered a way in for many journalists to actually cover this and look at this with different eyes. What about people in the Jewish community? The, the Jewish community is is, um, is very active on Israel. Mostly it's very pro-Israel and, and mostly um, people don't question the decisions of the state. What do you think is happening um, in terms of Jewish viewers? Are they beginning to question perhaps and, and embrace this idea that there can be these groups that are like bicultural, Israeli and Palestinian working on the same like justice issues? Yeah. I think that there's, you know, in, in it's interesting. I think you're obviously asking about uh, in, 
um, Jewish Americans, but I, I just wanted to start by talking about Israelis themselves. And I think in, in, in Israel, the biggest challenge is to counter the cynicism. Um, it's less a question of whether they you know, understand that there is a problem and that there's an injustice. It's more a question of whether they believing that civilians can actually do anything to change the situation. And even when they see the story, often the, the gut reaction is like, oh, this is just one village. And it's, it, you know, it was, there's particular reasons why this could happen there. It actually cannot be reproduced elsewhere. Um, and I do think that people uh, get shaken up and, and this this sort of very strict cynical view of the situation gets a little bit uh, challenged when they see a story like that um, because they, they really see you know individuals and they sympathize they can identify with people and I've seen and I've heard of stories of people after the film wanting to participate and get engaged in cold demonstrations and really check it out in the US I think there is um, a bigger sense of, of, of um, needing to defend the actions of the government no matter what. And I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, people have talked about the reasons for that. And I think this is common in every diaspora community uh, in the U.S. to often sometimes be more um, strictly defensive of actions of their governments than actually the local, the people who are living there are. Mm -hmm. I think the film has definitely had an impact on many people who left out of this belief that there was anything they could actually do. And I've heard many people talk about things like, I want to now come back and get engaged on this issue. I feel again re-inspired that I can do something. Um, there is a lot of people that react uh, at first in a, in a defensive way. Yeah. Um, and But I think often the people who are the most defensive are the ones who are most touched by the film and process it a lot on the long run. Did you feel, uh, you, you filmed some Israeli soldiers, uh, Yasmin Levy is one, um, and uh, she seems uh, pretty, uh, pretty much somebody who follows orders. Did you feel that, that she changed at all? Uh, you know, did she maybe uh, change her views? Did, I mean, how much do people change in this process? So you talk to people over time, right? Yeah, I don't think Yasmin changed her views so much. I think the in the in the during the demonstrations, I think she she had a big breakthrough when you know she she, was, she obviously obviously got to this village, being told that she was going to be meeting terrorists, and instead she met women young children singing, chanting, and that I think creates a mental psychological space for the person to understand that there's a legitimate grievance, grievance being, um, uh, demo, being expressed as opposed to if she felt that her life was being threatened, if violence was being used, she would probably not have that ability to really understand that situation. Right. Now that does not mean that she's gonna, that she's about at all to change sides and start demonstrating with the Palestinians, she still feels that she has a job to be done, which I think is very representative of the vast majority of uh, members of the Israeli army. What's happening uh, with the Supreme Court cases, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of cases that we don't hear about over here uh, in the U.S. Uh, where Palestinians and their Israeli attorneys are trying to go take this up to the Supreme Court to, to you know, to maybe have the wall pulled back or to get some compensation. I mean, when when the when the military government decides that they're going to, you know, take a piece of uh, uh, of land or take part of a village or te tear down trees, do they do they just do that without compensation, without any justification? Or do, is there any legal recor recourse? There, you know, in each village, is, is it varies the details of the process, but in general. Uh, they are given, the villagers are given about two weeks to try to complain. Um, in Budrus, Ayad was very clear that, you know, the next day they came with the bulldozers and if they had waited for two weeks, in those two weeks they would have lost all of the olive trees. Um, and so I think that there is a, a lot of skepticism around the actual ability for them to have real recourse. Uh, compensation is off, very often offered. Palestinians believe that if they accept compensation is a is an acknowledgement of the right of They're, the government to actually... So if it, for them it's like a sellout if they take the money? 
it's it's an acceptance of a military occupation and they the the idea of resisting using nonviolent tactics the first thing the first rule of civil disobedience is that you refuse to cooperate right. with your oppressor and so to to accept compensation would be a travesty in that regard you know in in Budrus, the one thing that's glaringly missing is any palestinian official role uh, where is the palestinian government the so-called leadership of the West Bank, where are they in all this? Uh, they were actually at first not only just absent but opposed to it. Uh, to the, the protests? To the protests. The Palestinian Authority um, has now since changed their, their point of view. And you see Salam Fayyad and many members, especially now in this period pre-election, although nobody knows exactly when elections are coming, but there's a bit of an electoral time. And uh, many of the people who are going to be running for office feel like they need to show up to these demonstrations um, because now it's a popular thing. But at the time that Budru started it, uh, they, there's a lot of fear that these were local forms of resistance that would be a threat to the authority of the PA. Um, and so there was actually an attempt to, um, you know, in, in subtle ways, crush it. What do you, what do you hope is going to happen with the film, um, with Budru? Um, what we hope is going to happen is that people um, in Israel, in the Palestinian territories and in the U.S. are going to start believing again that there is a role for civilians to play in changing the conflict, that waiting for politicians to resolve it um, is just going to be um, a, another cycle of violence that is going to lead to many, many more deaths and bloodshed. Um, and that in civil resistance and civil disobedience, nonviolence actions can actually lead to change.